Angels also are real beings that do exist. Okay? It is not somebody invented that God created angels. They were, we saw that they were created by God and they have a will. They make a decision. Those that chose to rebel against God, that was a choice. Those today that worship God have made a choice to worship God. Uh, they are also spirit beings. In other words, they're not material. They're spirit beings. Uh, they can take on uh, the form, though, of a man. We see that in the scriptures. They are also more powerful than man. Uh, they, there are two groups we talked about last week. There are two groups of angels. There are the angels that follow God, uh, worship, serve God, and the angels that follow uh, Satan. Now, the angels that follow God, they worship God, they serve and obey God, they minister to man, uh, they will accompany Christ at His return, while the angels of Satan, they execute God, uh, Satan's plan, and they afflict God's people. Now, what I want to do this morning is go specifically speaking on uh, stepping into the subject of Satan. It would fit. Sometimes people say, well, that's the doctrine of Satan. The, uh, Satanology, uh, but it really fits in the doctrine of angels, uh, really the unseen world, and uh, it is a, a real world. The uh, subject of Satan is important because the Bible talks much about Satan. Uh, we're going to see that in just a moment. Now, uh, there was a quote on May 3rd, 2017 this year, Father Arturo Sosa Abscal, uh, who is the Jesuit Superior General, claimed that Satan is a symbolic figure who doesn't really exist. Uh, his, this is his quote. He said this, We have created symbolic figures, such as the devil, in order to express in the reality of evil. Social conditioning also re represents that figure. Now, that's, that's a quote. This is a religious man, apparently. Uh, now, um, we didn't make that up. It's in the Scriptures. Uh, it's clearly laid out in the Scriptures that Satan is real. 1 Peter, notice chapter 5, verse number 8. 1 Peter, chapter 5. Verse number 8, notice the Bible says, <clears throat> Be sober, be vigilant, because, notice the, 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 the phrase, Your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He is encouraging Christians to be sober-minded by saying you have an adversary. You have a personal adversary, and that is the devil. And so this morning here, this is going to be two-part. I was beginning to uh, look at the, the subject here of... Um, of Satan, and uh, it's going to have to be two parts. So we're going to deal with the first two points this morning, and then next week we'll have the last two points uh, of this lesson as we deal with your adversary, uh, the devil. Now, the Bible talks much about uh, Satan. In Zechariah, let me give you a few verses that you have there uh, in your notes there. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Uh, and the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Uh, so we see throughout the scriptures, Satan is real. He is a true adversary, a true opposer. Job chapter 1, verse 6, we're familiar with that. Now there was a, uh, there were, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now the word, the, uh, the uh, sons of God refers to the angels of God. We see that several times throughout the scripture. And Satan was among them. Now don't, don't think, wow, I mean, how does he fit in? Because we have in our mind that he has got horns and a pitchfork and a, a tail. No, that's not the devil. He is transformed into an angel of light. So think as the sons of God come to God and give the report as they uh, do the ministry of God that they're commanded to do, Satan comes in the midst of them. Now God is not fool though. You see, Satan can fool man, but he cannot fool God. Uh, and so he uh, may appear as an angel of light, perhaps among other, uh, the other angels who may not know, but God knows. Uh, John chapter 13, verse 2 says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. You see, the devil is an influencer. And Peter said uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, And Peter said, Ananias, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price? Of the land. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, the Bible says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 1 Peter 5 8, that we just read here again, mentions our ad your adversary, the devil. Now, Satan is referred to uh, a, uh, in seven Old Testament books under different names. In the New Testament, he is referred to by all of the writers and is mentioned ni in 19 books. So, all the writers mention uh, Satan. Uh, his, think about the names that we find uh, concerning Satan in the Word of God. Lucifer, which is really his first name, Isaiah 14, 12. Satan, uh, throughout the Scriptures, 1 Chronicles 21, 1. 
He's referred to as the devil, Matthew 4.1. He's referred to as the dragon, Revelation 20.20. 20. He's called the accuser, Revelation 12.10. He's called that old serpent, Revelation 22. He's called the tempter in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. He's called the adversary in 1 Peter 5.8. He's called the prince and power of the air, according to Ephesians 2.2. He's called the god of this world, according to, first, uh, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He's called the wicked one, according to 1 John 2.14. He's called the prince of this world in John 14.30. He's called the prince of the devils in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. He's called the father of lies and a liar, according to John chapter 8, verse 44. He's called a murderer, according to John 8.44. He is called, he is the chief of the fallen angels. Uh, the Bible refers to as his angels. Think about it, the angels that follow Satan are his angels, according to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. He, the Bible says that he transforms into an angel of light, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. So the Bible talks about the devil. He is a real adversary, and he's always been a real adversary uh, since his fall. And so as we uh, consider the doctrine of uh, Satan, as we continue the doctrine of angels, we're studying now not the, the angels that are following the Lord, the worshiping, serving Him, and carrying out His uh, his, uh, uh, his, uh, his work, but we're referring to the angels that are following Satan, and we're going to start with Satan, and then we're going to look at the transitioning here that he's got goons that do his bidding. And uh, so we're going to look at that, uh, not this week, but next week. But let's focus on Satan this morning. Notice number one in your notes. First of all, we see the origin of Satan. The origin of Satan. Now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. In Ezekiel chapter 28... We find a passage here, and uh, in the context, he begins the chapter by talking about uh, the king of Tyrus, uh, the prince of Tyrus, uh, from verse 1 down to verse 11. But then from verse 11 down to verse 19, he transitions, and we believe, according to the scriptures, that he's speaking of the devil. He's speaking of Satan, he's speaking of Lucifer. Notice verse 11. Moreover, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now let's stop. Obviously, he's not talking about the king of Tyre, because he was not there in the garden of Eden. Uh, the Bible continues, the Bible says here, um, uh, every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, and the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, and the emerald, and the uh, carbuncle, and gold, and workmanship, and thy tabrets, and of thy pipes, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou, wast, uh, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy, in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Some people have said that this refers, uh, could refer to Adam, but I don't think so. He's not, he was not covered with gold and carbuncle and, saf and sapphire, uh, but the devil was. And here the Bible says here it cannot refer to the king of Tyre because the Bible says that when he was created, he was perfect in all his ways. You see, this is speaking of the devil. Uh, and the Bible says here that he was created and uh, he was a, a, a really a being that was elevated above all the other angels. He had a position of leadership as God is a God of structure. He had a, 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 a really a, um, a structure of leadership within the angels and we believe that Satan was at the top of that. Uh, he was at the top. Uh, so here he addresses Satan. This does not refer again uh, to the king of Tyre, but to every, uh, nor every man conceived since Adam, but to Satan himself. Now, let's look at Satan as we consider the origin of Satan. Your notes we see, first of all, as we stay here in Ezekiel 28, we see, first of all, letter A, Satan's creation. We look and saw last week that angels are created beings. They're not eternal. They had a beginning. Uh, now, they are created, they live forever, they do not die uh, as far as physically as man dies, they live uh, eternally. Uh, but notice, number one, we see Satan's creation. Now, the Bible describes in his creations several things about the way he was created. Notice the first one here under Satan's creation. First of all, we see his wisdom and beauty. His wisdom and beauty. Ezekiel 28, 12 tells us that he was created full of wisdom and perfect in beauty full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. 
Uh, perhaps Lucifer was the most beautiful of all the angels of heaven. Therefore, because God placed him at, think, of, think about it, God gave him the position of leadership in the worship of God. Therefore, God would make him the most beautiful one because he would be leading the host of the angels into the worship of the true and living God. Uh, not only do we see his wisdom and beauty in his creation, but number two, we see his worship. In Ezekiel 28, notice verse 13. The Bible tells us here at the end of the verse, The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Notice verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So we see that Lucifer was also created to be the leader of the angelic worship of God. The Bible talks about the tablets and the pipes that was prepared in thee. In other words, the purpose of Satan's creation was to worship God, to lead in this worship of God, and he was created for that special reason. There was a special purpose for his creation, and that was to glorify God and to lead all of the angels in worshiping the true and living God. So in his creation, we not only see his wisdom and beauty, number two, we see his worship, but number three, we see his worth. Verse 15 tells us, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. Lucifer was created perfect, and so was man. As was, by the way, all of God's creation. Remember when God looked at everything that he made, he said it was good. When he created man, he said it has been very good. You see, everything that God created was perfect. God is not the author of sin. He is not the author of evil. Uh, he is the creator. He is the perfect creator, if you would. And so when Lucifer was created, he was, uh, his worth was that he was perfect in all of his ways. God did not create Lucifer in the, thing, in the way that we think in our mind as an evil being. He did not create that. Now, he did create angels that, had, that make a choice to either worship God or to not worship God, and so we know we'll see that in just a moment. But we see his creation, his wisdom and beauty, his worship, and his worth. Everybody got the blanks there? There was the three ones? All right. Letter B, we see Satan's choice. Not only Satan's creation, but we see Satan's choice. In verse 15, the Bible tells us that Satan was created. He was perfect in all his ways from the day of his creation. The Bible says here, Till iniquity was found in thee. So what was the iniquity? What was the iniquity? Well, we know we attribute that to, we say pride. But notice Isaiah chapter 14. Let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 14. We find exactly uh, what was the iniquity that was found in Lucifer. Isaiah chapter 14. <clears throat> notice if we... Um, Begin in verse 12. The question, he begins with a question, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Now, uh, that's answering the question. What was the iniquity? The question here is, how are you fallen? Well, what, is it, what happened for you as you were created perfect and you were the leader of the worship of God? What happened? And the Bible tells us, How art thou cut down to the ground in which, which didst weaken the nations? Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven... I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So what was the iniquity of Satan? The iniquity of Satan was this, I. I will do this. I will be above God. I'm not going to worship God anymore. I'm going to be above God. I'm not going to be dictated what I need to do. I'm going to dictate people what they ought to do for me. And so again, it's the sin of pride. He, want to, he wanted to be lifted up above God. God does not share His glory with anyone. He is the only one that is worthy of honor and worship. And so Satan, the iniquity of Satan was pride. Satan thought of himself more highly than he ought to think. He wanted to be exalted above his Creator. And unless we think that that's just reserved to angels, that's what man does all the time. Man's attempt, you think of humanism, what is it? Man wants to be God. 
Man is elevating himself uh, above God, and no one can do that. The Bible tells us in, in, back in Ezekiel 28, 17, says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Uh, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom that by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee be uh, before kings that they may behold thee. And so what is it that lifted up was his beauty. He saw himself, and he thought to himself, You know what? I'm the leader of the worship of angels. I am elevated above all the angels. I'm in charge of all the angels. Why can I be in charge of God? And so we see here that he was lifted up because of his beauty. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 tells us that a pastor ought not to be a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. You see, the same thing that took place, and by the way, that is a decision. Pride is a decision that we make where we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. And the Bible reminds the preacher that he, not, he ought not to be a novice and experienced, lest he be lifted up with pride, uh, follow the same pattern of the devil, and fall into the same condemnation. So we see Satan's creation, Satan's choice. But number three, we see Satan's character. So what is he like? The word wisdom has the, no, the, the Bible talks about the, 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 the word wisdom, and there's different uh, forms of wisdom. Uh, the wisdom that Satan was, was not really the wisdom uh, that is, uh, that um, he used his skill, if you would, for the glory of God, but now he's using his skill for different reasons. Uh, to oppose God. We see, first of all, according to the Word of God and His character, uh, notice uh, under the blanks there, under letter C, we see, first of all, His craftiness. He's crafty. He's wise. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, verse 11, notice, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You see, the devil is crafty. Remember Ephesians 6 to 11, we read that the Bible says here, but put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against what? The wiles of the devil. Now the word wiles means properly that which is traced out with method. Uh, that which is well laid such as art, skill, cunning. This speaks of the devil's means, his plans, his schemes, which are used to deceive, to entrap, to enslave, and to ruin the souls of men. So showing us here, he's showing us that he knows the weak spots in the, lives of, in the life of Christians. He is crafty. He uses wiles. He has got a plan, a scheme, a deceptive plan laid out to entrap people, to blind people, to throw people off course. Why? Because he is crafty. So we see his craftiness. But number two, we see his capability. Uh, Satan is powerful. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The Antichrist, he's referring to, is going to come in what? In the power of Satan. Now the power of Satan is with, notice, signs and lying wonders. So the power, the signs and the lying wonders, that's what Satan is capable of. Satan uh, has great power. We see that his, his power, think about over Job's life. The ability that Satan had in a moment to destroy someone's life and dispose of all his human possessions. That's what the devil is capable of. Now let's stop and say this, that he, was not, he could not do that unless God allowed him to do that. Now what, what do you want? Ultimately it was his pride. He says, well, Job just worshiping, worshiping you because you bless him. But if you take all that away, he'll stop worshiping you. No, as a matter of fact, Job, Job didn't stop worshiping God. He continued to worship God and it shows the foolishness of Satan. But let's not forget, it shows his power. He is powerful. And just in a moment, in a day, he can destroy someone's life. That's his power. Oh, so we not only see his craftiness, his capability, but number three, we see his con. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 tells us, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now an angel of light would be referring to the angels of God. The, the word angel sometimes is the word messenger, refers to uh, the pastor of a church. But Satan does not approach man as displaying himself to bring harm upon people's lives. That's not how the devil comes. He appears as an angel of light. That's why it's a con. You see, the devil is a deceiver. He is the great deceiver. 
Uh, he's crafty, so he makes people believe something uh, that is not the truth. And sometimes we have the idea, wow, you know, it, 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 when the devil comes, it'll be evident. No, that's not, not, not so. Again, as I said, he doesn't come, he doesn't have the horns, he doesn't have the tail wagging with the pitchfork. That's not how he comes. Because you know what? That wouldn't work. You see, he's got to make people believe something that is not the truth. He's got to appear as if he is Son of God. That's how he has to appear. Think about how devastating that can be. Think about how devastating that has been in this world. You see, the world, although there are crazies out there that worship Satan, that, that, that's not who's opposing the work of God. Those that are opposing the work of God are those that are the closest to the truth. The most dangerous lie is the lie that is closest to the truth that people have bought. You see, the angel comes, uh, or Satan comes as an angel of light. He is conning. He is deceiving. And we have to be careful. So we see, uh, not only here, uh, Satan's creation, Satan's choice, but we uh, see Satan's character, his craftiness, his capability, and his con. Number two, Roman numeral two there in your notes, we see the objective of Satan. So, what is his objective? Now, as we begin in our notes uh, last week, we saw we boil down two things that uh, the angels that follow Satan do. They execute Satan's plan and they afflict God's people. So we're going to see here the objective of Satan. And really, I want us to look at two things. Letter A, first of all, we see his oppression of the world. Satan's oppression of the world. The oppression that Satan brings upon the world is twofold. First of all, it is, we see the physical. All right, the first oppression is physical. If you want to already put down the second one, it'll be the spiritual. Satan's oppression today is both physical and spiritual. Suffering in this world, you know, sometimes people say, wow, if if God was really alive, He would not allow that to happen. Well, you forgot it about somebody. You forgot about Satan, who is the one that we see in the Scripture causes suffering. You have the reference there in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. The Bible says, "...and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all manner, uh, all that were oppressed of the devil." You see, when Jesus Christ came, He healed those that were what? He healed those in the world that were oppressed of the devil. This oppression is not talking about the spiritual oppression. The oppression is talking about a physical oppression. Remember Mary, Mary Magdalene, she had seven devils. And the impact on her life was a physical impact, although there was spiritual, but it was also physical. You think about all the disease and all the things that are going on out there. Who's the author of that? The devil is the author of that. It's not God. Now, we know a lot of those things are the consequences of sin, but we see the devil is the oppressor of this world. He causes suffering. Luke 13, 16, the Bible says, And out of this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had, hath, had bound, lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. A woman was, was suffering 17 years because Satan had bound her. You see, Satan uh, is uh, physically oppressing the world. He is the one that causes suffering. Number two, he's also the one, in your notes you see there, uh, that causes death. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Who is it that has the power of death? The corner of the Bible is the devil. You see, the devil has the power of death in this world. Now, we know that at the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ took that power away from him. So the devil has no more power over those that believe on his name. You see, but the devil has power. He is the one that causes suffering. He is the one that causes death. He also is the one that causes possession. And what I mean by that is, Demon possession or devil possession. John 13, 20, 27 tells us, And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Who? Judas Iscariot. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now, Judas was not a believer. He was interested in money. He was not interested in Christ. And therefore, Satan possessed Judas 
to carry out the plan of Satan, to oppose Christ. Uh, you see, he oppresses uh, in a physical way, in a real, genuine way, through suffering, through death, uh, and through possession. That is real. But not only do we see the, the physical oppression, but number two, we see the spiritual oppression. It's not just something that's physical, it's also spiritual. No, notice, first of all, the Bible tells us and shows us that he ensnares. That's your first blank there under the spiritual oppression in the world. We see he ensnares. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. The Bible says, "...and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will." You see, he ensnares, he entraps. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7 says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You see, Satan lays snares for men so that he can use them to hinder the work of God in this world. What is the devil trying to do? He is trying to oppose the work of God. So what does he do? He entraps people. He ensnares people. Uh, that particular reference in 1 Timothy chapter 3, what is he talking about? He's talking about the pastors and the deacons. You see, so what does the devil want to do? He wants to ensnare people to cause the work of God to be halted. Why? Because what does, who does God use in this world? He uses people. He told his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So what does the devil do? He wants to snare, ensnare those people, entrap those people. And he does that in many ways. Through sin and through temptation and all those things. And when a man succumbs to the temptation of the devil, he is ensnared. He is trapped to where now the work of God cannot be carried out. So we see the spiritual. He ensnares, but number two, he influences. In John chapter 13, verse 2, the Bible says, And supper being in, and the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Who is it that put that, 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 that desire in the heart of, uh, of, of Judas? It was Satan. Satan did that. Now, you know what he did? Judas was interested in money throughout his ministry of accompanying Christ. That's what he was interested in. When the woman uh, who uh, offered the ointment to Christ and poured it on his head and the other one poured it on his feet, there was a complaint there that they, it was wasted. And Jesus Christ said that that, that was not wasted. Wow, well, the money could have been given to the poor. He was interested in more money, keeping money for himself. So you know what Satan did? He's going to tempt him. He's going to put a thought into Judas. He's not going to cause Judas, not, I know he possessed him, but he influenced his heart first. With what? With money. Hey, Judas, you could sell him. I'm sure the religious people would give you money for that. Well, you know what? Yeah, I didn't think about that. I'm, I'm, I'm making quite a bit of money here, but you know what? He just kind of exposed me that if the one that dips, right, the bread and the wine is he... So maybe this is time for me to take the, my last advantage of that. Who is it? Satan put that in his heart. Sometimes people think, well, and, and sometimes it is, well, that's just, you know, sin, that's just the way I am. Have you ever thought that perhaps the devil put that in your heart? That evil desire? Yeah, he's capable of doing that. He did that. For now, Judas was not a saved man, but we, uh, but we see that that's what he did in Judas. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, remember Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? The problem here was not the land. The problem was the lie. You see, they lied, and it was the devil that put that in his heart that said, and Ananias and Sapphira, they were apparently part of the church there, and uh, they were giving quite a bit of money there. And the Bible says that it's Satan that filled your heart. You allowed room for Satan to fill your heart with saying, you know what, let's make it appear as if we're giving all the money, but we're just giving a part. And Peter said, Satan has filled your heart. See, the devil can't possess a believer, but he sure can influence the heart with the things of the world. So not only do we see he ensnares, he influences, but number three, we see he blinds. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which, the is, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. Uh, you know, sometimes this will refuse Calvinism because sometimes people say, well, uh, you know, God chooses people to be saved and chooses people not to be saved. Have you ever thought that the devil is the one that blinds people? It's not God. 
God is not the one that blinds people. The devil is the one that blinds people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God wants everybody to know as the gospel goes forth, what is the devil trying to do? He's trying to take that away. Take that truth away. You see, the devil blinds the minds of unbelieving men to prevent them from receiving the light of the gospel. He is the one that does the work. It, he is, the Bible says, the God of this world who has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Then they say, oh, wow, I just can't. I've tried to witness them, and they just don't believe. Satan has blinded them to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So not only does he ensnare, he influences, he blinds, but number four, we see he dissipates truth. We see throughout the scriptures as Jesus Christ, remember, as he was talking about the different grounds and the seed falling on different ground. He made an interesting uh, 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 comment there as he sp spoke on the, uh, the uh, seed going by the wayside. In Mark chapter 4, verse 15, he says, And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, what does Satan do? Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. You know, that's why Jesus Christ had an emphasis, don't delay, today is the day of salvation. Make that decision now, because if you wait, the devil's going to snatch that word away. And many times as people, they get to the place where they think, well, you know what, I, I just won't make that decision. I'll just wait a little bit. The devil's going to take that away. You see that whatever was sown in your heart, the devil's going to come himself and dissipate the truth. In other words, we see the cares of this world. He influences perhaps our hearts towards the cares of this world. Matthew 13, 19, he says, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. Truth is very valuable to man. Why? Because Jesus said, The truth shall make you free. Therefore, Satan's objective is to remove the truth from the hearts and the minds of men. That's what he does. It's a spiritual battle going on. That's why uh, Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, principalities, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's an influence in this world. It is the influence of the devil and his angels who are opposing the truth, the gospel, and the work of God in this world. And that's real. Say, why, why, why do we have uh, so many prayer meetings here? Because there's a spiritual battle going on. That's why. And we probably should have more prayer meetings. Why? Because there's a spiritual battle going on. So we see not only the, op the oppression of the world, it's physical and the spiritual, but letter B, we see the opposition to the saints. The devil is not happy with people that are serving God. He's not at all. As a matter of fact, it probably infuriates him. Why? Because he doesn't want God to get the glory. Since the beginning, that's the, that's, since the time of his fall, that's been his desire. He wants to rob God of the glory that's rightly due to him. And therefore, when people, his creation, serve God, worship him in spirit and in truth, and follow his word, the devil doesn't like it. He hates it. And therefore, he's going to oppose that. Notice, Lord, the opposition to the saints. First of all, we see his opposition to the church. <clears throat> we see, first of all, and his opposition to the church, we see that twofold. First of all, we see his mixture. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, if you would please. Matthew chapter 13. This is where, if you would, the rubber meets the road, because this deals with us. Notice Matthew 13, uh, let's uh, read verse 25. The Bible says, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Notice the Bible says, His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. The wheat are believers, the tare are unbelievers. Notice verse 38. He says, The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. That's believers. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Notice verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. So how is God opposing the saints today? He is opposing the saints in his opposition to the church. He sows tares among the good seed. 
You see, Satan sows tares in God's field. He mixes his children up with God's children. This is seen in the, in the world and really in the churches today. Where people are not interested in having a true born-again converts attending their church. They're interested in anybody. You know what Satan is doing? Satan is filling up churches with tares. Those that aren't true and again believers. Those that have no desire to follow God. They just want a religious experience. What is Who is doing that work? Satan is doing that work. How can he weaken the work of God? He weakens the work of God by mixing up his churches with unbelievers. That's what he does. Say, so why are you getting so excited? This is just Sunday school. Just because that's going on today. Not only do we see his mixture, but we see his ministers. He's got goons that follow him and do his bidding. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, the Bible says, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is, not, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So they may appear, look, the Bible says they are false, notice, apostles, deceitful workers that transform themselves into what? Into the apostles of Christ. You have the twelve apostles, and, Jesus, and, and Paul said, look, there are false apostles. They may appear like the apostles of Christ, but the truth is, they're the apostles of Satan. They're opposing the work of God. And let me tell you, you may not see it at first, but you look at down, the road, the, down the road, the fruit that comes out of that. Then you find out whether these were truly the ministers of God or the ministers of Satan. Emory Bancroft wrote, he says, Much of the apostasy of the 20th century can be ascribed to the emissaries of Satan and the interest in white and black magic as well as the pervasive presence of the occult provides contemporary evidence that that which Paul speaks of that which Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians. We see here that this is real. That's why we have to test everything by the Word of God. We don't follow men today, we follow Christ and His Word that He has prescribed and left for us. Why? Because the, the devil is interested in destroying the church. Jesus Himself said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. <clears throat> this was not guarantees that God will protect every local church. He guarantees that there will always be a church that follows Him. But many churches are, have been under attack, have been filled, filled with terrors, have been filled with ministers of Satan. That's the truth. You see, because God has chosen to do His work in this world through the local New Testament church. That's what God has chosen to do His work in this world. And therefore Satan wants to oppose the church. So we see the opposition of the church and his opposition to the saints. But number two, we see his opposition to the consecrated. And what I mean the consecrated, I'm speaking of the ministers of Christ, the missionaries, the pastors, the deacons, those that are position of leaderships in the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, Paul wrote, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered me. You see, Paul realized that although he had a desire to do something and to fulfill the plan of God, Satan stood in his way, hindered, uh, worked out some circumstances in the life of Paul to where he made him unable to go to a certain place. Who did that? Satan did. Zechariah 3 1, we saw as we began in the, uh, earlier in the lesson, and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angels of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. See, there was a priest that day, and what happened? Satan was going to resist him. Stand against the priest. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, the Bible says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Satan undoubtedly hinders the missionary work of Paul and did hinder the missionary work of Paul, but Paul was also buffeted, by the, he says, by a messenger of Satan. But let's stop and say this here. Yes, he was, uh, 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 yes, he was opposed. He was afflicted. He was buffeted. But you know what Paul did? He turned that opposition for good. You know what he says? You know what? God allowed Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. 
See, so Satan thought here, I got Paul here. I'm going to discourage him. He's going to get sidetracked from doing the missionary work. And Paul says, you know what? God allowed that so that I would not be exalted above measure. You see, Satan thinks he's one, but he's not one in the life of the Christian. And we have to be very careful when there's the opposition of Satan, there's the buffeting of Satan, and we get discouraged and fall by the wayside. God designed, allowed him to do that for us to be helped by it and not destroyed by it. We not only see his opposition to the church, his opposition to the consecrated, but lastly, we see his opposition to the Christian. In Luke 23, 31, the Bible says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard of a, a, a low a voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. You see, the devil, what he wants to do? He wants to have believers. He wanted to have Peter that he may sift him as wheat. We also learn that he accuses the brethren. What has the work of God done? He cleanses us. He sanctifies us. He sets us apart for his glory. So you know what the devil does? He says, you're not good enough to serve God. Look at your life. Look at your sin. You're good for nothing. And God says, no, you're not good for nothing. I died for you. But see, the devil comes in and accuses the brethren. He says, ah, you, 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 look at your life. Would a Christian really do that? Would a Christian act like that? Would a Christian think those thoughts? He's the accuser of the brethren. Don't buy that. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Listen to the words of Christ. Amen. You're redeemed. You're justified. You're sanctified. You've been set apart for a special use. You're my peculiar people. Don't listen to the false accusations of this great accuser. He wants to have you. He wants to put you on the shelf. He wants you to be ineffective for the cause of Christ. That's the devil. Now... We're going to see the next two points next week. We're going to see the orders of Satan and the, the, the demons and the goons that follow him. But then we're going to see the overcoming of Satan. <laughs> this may be discouraged, but come back next week. You're going to be encouraged. <laughs> we win. God, we don't win. God wins. God wins. So, yeah, come back next week. All right, let's pray. Father.